fellow who has to keep you wondering right straight through the picture whether he is going to get the girl, whether evil is going to triumph over good. I once did a film years ago that had three villains in it. Oh, it was a lovely picture. And uh, the three villains were three sort of classic types of villains. Uh, there were the three villains, and of course there was a hero and a heroine too. But the three villains were very different. There was John Hodiak, Charles Lawton, and myself. Now, John Hodiak was the sort of sleek, dark-haired kind of villain with flashing eyes and teeth that went right around his head, you know. <laughs> and then there was Charles Lawton, who was a kind of cuddly kind of villain. And then there was, of course, the perfect, the suave, the elegant villain. <laughs> Myself. And uh, anyway, in this picture, the leading lady really preferred the villains. Now, before I go any further and tell you about it, I must pay tribute to this lady, this particular great star of films. She, of all the women that I've ever worked with, Lana Turner, Jane Russell, all these great sort of sex kittens or whatever you want to call them, all those terrible name publicity agents, dream up about because she's the only one who I ever really believed was a genuinely sexy girl. Her name was Ava Gardner. Oh dear. <laughs> Every time I think about her I go limp. Well no not exactly. That is <laughs> you know actually when, when I was working with Ava Gardner, at the end of the picture, we were a very nice company of people, and they gave a little party for us after the picture was over, and they had a little orchestra there, and we all had a chance to dance with Ava Gardner, and I was dancing with her. And, well, the only way I... Well, I don't know what it was, but she just fit. <laughs> It was like dancing with a warm, wet towel. <laughs> and if you haven't tried it, don't knock it, kids, because She was sensation. But anyway, in this picture, in the beginning, she was in love with John Hodiak, with his flashing eyes and his teeth. And then Charles Lawton killed John Hodiak, and she kind of thought Charles Lawton was kind of cute. So she cuddled up with him for a bit. And then I killed Charles Lawton, and then she came over to me, the perfect, the suave, the beautiful woman. And then in the end, the hero kills me. And what does she end up with? Robert Taylor. <laughs> Can you imagine such a letdown from Hodiak to Lawton to Price to Robert Taylor? No. <laughs> but the, the villain is a very necessary part of the plot of any drama because basically, basically drama is a story of conflict. The conflict of good and evil. And you can't have one without the other. It is true in every drama, from the beginning of the written drama, from the beginning of the, the memorized drama, right straight down to today. And you have the, the villain representing evil and the hero representing good, basically. And the villain keeps up the suspense, as I say. Many times his character is a much more interesting character to play than the hero, because the hero is just so damn good, you know. I mean, he goes right straight down the straight and narrow path, while the villain has to be kind of devious. He has to kind of trick you all the time, and so he's hiding behind a million faces, never to let you know whether he is good, whether he is bad. He's a fascinating challenge always to play. And he needn't be a drab or unattractive character by a long shot. As a matter of fact, the Aristotelian theory of drama, or part of it, in that theory, Aristotle feels that the villain, the person who has to pay the piper at the end, should indeed be a man of great learning, of great class, of great wealth, of great station in life. Because then, if that man has to pay for his sins, we, the common man watching the drama, 
can identify and think if it happens to this great man, it can also happen to us. That is the Aristotelian theory of drama, as a matter of fact. And, you know, I wasn't always a villain, not by a long shot. I started out my career playing some of the goodest men that ever lived. I played, for instance, Joseph Smith in the story Brigham Young, and a, a fascinating man Joseph Smith was. And then my very first part actually was one of the goodest men that ever lived. His name was Albert, the prince consort to Queen Victoria. He was so good that they called him Albert the Good. And when I was studying to play this part in London before it came over to New York, I, uh, I was a very serious young actor and very excited about trying to learn how to play a part and had a fascinating time studying about Albert, but I was having a, a terrible time trying to make him into a human being. He was so good. He was an extraordinary man, Prince Albert, you know. He was, for instance, the man whose intervention kept England out of the Civil War on the side of the South. With his own money, he started the first great world exposition, and with the money he made from that, he started five of the major colleges at the University of London. He was an extraordinarily good human being. And as I looked further, I, I kept piling up all these goodnesses, but I couldn't find any kind of humanity on which to, to hang the cloak of my performance. And then finally, as I read more about him, I found he was indeed rather human. I mean, he had a temper, he could show his temper, he was a little bit jealous. He had a bit of a problem taking care of this very, uh, very strong-willed young lady, Queen Victoria. And he must have been pretty human because the two of them had 11 children. And, um, you know, I mean, I found that there was you, some humanity, but one of the problems that really worried me was every time I saw a picture of Prince Albert or a, a statue of him, he always was standing like, uh, you know, absolutely erect, the most beautiful carriage I've ever seen. And being a slob from Missouri, I, I just was having a very hard time doing it. And the director of the play kept after me, and he said, stand up straight, look at the pictures of Albert. I said, all right, I will. <laughs> so one day, I, uh, in this kind of eagerness, which I still have, thank goodness, I went over to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It's probably the greatest museum of the decorative arts in the world. And I went to the curator of costumes, and I said, I'm an American, and I'm playing Prince Albert, and I'm having a terrible trouble trying to recreate his posture. And he said, well, Mr. Price, you must remember that he was a soldier, that he was a German, and that he was trained by the military all through his life. And I said, yes, but, the, you know, I mean, I, my mother's been poking me in the back all my life to stand up straight, but it hasn't worked. And I said, do you have any of his uniforms by any chance? And he said, yes, as a matter of fact, we do. We have all of the sort of major uniforms that Albert wore throughout his lifetime in England, and many of Queen Victoria's too. And I said, no, Albert's will do for now. So anyway, he went over to a cupboard and he pulled out a great long line of uniforms that Prince Albert had actually worn. And there they were. And it looked like Albert was still in them. <laughs> and I said, do you, do you mind if I just feel one? Well, I went over and felt it, and then I knew why Albert had such beautiful carriage. From the ribs to the hips, there were Toledo steel blades that went right down. Well, he was like this, of course. If he'd ever bent over, he would have sprung right back into shape. <laughs> But anyway, I thought, well, you know, if Albert could do it, I can do it too. So on the way down to rehearsal that day, I stopped it in an athletic store. That's one of those places where they sell things to athletes. And I uh, bought one of those little corsets, you know, that middle-aged men wear when they're playing golf to sort of hold their stomach in and to keep their backs from breaking. And um, I put this little corset on and I laced it very tight. And there I was, instant Albert. <laughs> Just beautiful. And I walked down to rehearsal and I walked in, the director said, now, there you are. Now you are Albert. 
Wonderful, Vincent. That's the way you should look at it. I said, thank you very much and passed out. <laughs> About a half hour later, when somebody had enough sense to open something other than my collar, they uh, found out why. But I learned a great lesson from that. You know, acting is make-believe. I don't care how realistic an actor claims he is, how Marlon Brando they claim they are, and how method they are. <laughs> acting is still make-believe, and it's a two-fold act of make-believe. In the first place, I must make myself believe that I am the character I am portraying, and if I believe it, I can make you believe it. And so it is a double act of make-believe. And I learned from that experience that I couldn't wear a corset and become instant Albert, not at all. I had to think Albert, to be Albert, to know about Albert. Well, I went out to Hollywood and played a couple of um, kind of goody characters and then I came back to the stage and played a very goody character, uh, a young priest in a, in a play with Lorette Taylor and then finally I thought, you know, I'm just getting stuck with these goodies. I've got to find myself a good baddie. <laughs> so I looked around and I read a play called Angel Street. Some of you may remember it. It was later made into a movie called Gaslight. And when I read this play, I knew immediately that I had found the absolutely perfect villain. Angel Street probably ran longer than any psychological melodrama in the history of Broadway. Ran three years. When I read it, I thought, oh boy, this is the character that I should play. He was everything that a villain should be.